Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Happy Easter. We're so glad you're here. We know there's a lot of places you could be. We're glad you joined us. I know there's a lot of people in here that are morning people. I'm glad you're here too. But for everyone else who chose to come to this service to make room for some other people later on, we're really grateful that you did that. Thank you for being here. Kristen, let us know what's going to happen today. Awesome. So first of all, we want to welcome everyone who's joining us online. We're not losing out on you. If you just rolled out of bed, we're so happy for you. But first of all, we're going to start off service by worshiping together. The band's going to come out and join us on stage. And if you want to sing along, you can do so by following along with on the screens. After that, we're going to hear what's happening in the life of Vail. And then Pastor Sean is going to come out and share an incredible message about our risen King. Awesome, awesome. We'll get started real soon. But for now, attention neighbor and ask them, what is your favorite Easter memory?
Good morning. We're so glad you're here. We're going to get started real soon. Before we do that, Kristen, let everyone who's new know what's going to happen today. Awesome. So first of all, if you are new, I just want to say welcome. We know there are tons of places you could be right now, and the fact that you chose to spend part of your weekend here at Vail, it means so much to us. And if you're joining us online, we're so thankful for you as well. Even if you just roll out of bed, still in your pajamas, you made it. Thank you. So first of all, the band is going to come out and join us on stage. We're going to start off service by worshiping together. Now, if you want to sing along, which... I don't know. I kind of highly encourage you to. What about you, Josh? You made it this way. You might as well sing. Let's raise some hands. Let's raise our voices. Let's worship a risen Savior. Exactly. And then after that, we're going to hear what's happening in the life of Vail. And then Pastor Sean is going to come out and share an incredible message about our risen King. Awesome, awesome. Well, we're going to get started in right about two minutes.
Easter. We're so glad you're here. We know there's a lot of places you can be this weekend. And the fact you chose to spend some of your time with us means the world to us. We have an empty tomb. We have a risen Savior. We have a King who sits on the throne. And we're going to lift our voices and sing and worship together. We will lift our eyes. We won't fear the fight. There is one who's stronger. Heart pressed on each side, we will not lose sight of the one who's greater. This one name, one name holds every victory. One voice that silences the enemy. One key who reigns for all.
celebrate a risen king today man we are so excited to see how god continues to show up this weekend and we are glad that you are here to experience this with us you good you okay here's the thing jesus is risen so am i Je jesus is risen and so did josh so it's fine it's cool Man, we are glad you guys are here with us today. Would you guys take a moment to pray with me? God, we are so thankful for who you are. We are so thankful for your love for us. God, you love us so much that you sent your son to live a perfect life for us, to die for us, and then to conquer sin and the grave for us. God, we thank you. We love you. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. And you guys can go ahead and grab a seat. And today we are excited because we get to celebrate the greatest victory ever. A victory that you and I get to have because of who Jesus is and what he did for every single one of us. We have a king who loves us more than we can ever understand. And it's because of that reason that we get to celebrate and worship today. And so as we continue the celebration, I wanna invite you to listen to Hillary's story about when she met her king. My name is Hillary Pacia, and I've called Vail home for nearly 19 years. Vail changed my life because when I walked through those doors for the first time, I only knew about God through rules, but this is where I learned about relationships. And it was through those Christ-centered connections, through things like sisterhood or joining a small group for the first time, even though that's scary, I found life wasn't meant to be alone and done alone. And so it was through that I found that support and I even started leading a small group because of it because I knew how intentional connection was so key to my relationship with Jesus. And then there was Rooted. That was by far the most impactful thing that I've done here at Vail. We're always talking about next steps and I didn't know what my next steps were. 
And then when Rooted came along, I knew that's where I belong. Because of Rooted, I started fostering children. And even in February 2020, I started a nonprofit called One Hope Project. And that's helping people right here in our community who are battling eating disorders. I'm so thankful for all that Vail has offered here and, and ways to take next steps and get in community. But man, real life transformation happened for me when I made Jesus the king of my life. That's when everything changed. Oh, man. Well, hey, once again, welcome. My name is Corey. I've got the privilege of serving on the team here at Vail. It is so good to be with you guys here in the room. Those of you online with us, those of you who are in overflow out in the lobby, we are glad that you all are here. We want to give a special welcome and shout out to our first time guests. Let's give it up for them. We are so glad that you're here with us this weekend. And if you are visiting with us, I want to ask you to do one thing for me. If you can get your phone out, send a text to us. Text the word NEXT to 309-777-0677. We would love to be able just to reach out and connect with you real quick this week. If you're in the room and you got elementary age or younger kids, I want to make sure you know about Veil Kids. Every weekend, every service, Veil Kids creates a fun and safe environment where your kids get to learn about the love of Jesus in an incredible way. And so if you've got your kids with you in the room, you can still head across the lobby, check them in. They would love to have your kids come and hang out with them today. They get to do an Easter egg hunt and all that stuff. It's going to be a blast. But adults, we got some things for you too. And so I wanna let you know about two connection opportunities happening soon. Our next men's event is happening on Tuesday, April 9th. We're gonna be heading over to Gill Street to eat some food, throw some axes. It's gonna be a great time for guys high school age and up. And ladies, our next sisterhood event is happening on Friday, May 3rd. And so you can find out more information about both of those events and register for them through our website or through the Veiled Church app. As we get ready for our message today, I want to invite you to look around you, say hi to a couple people, and then answer this question, what is your favorite Easter candy? And Peeps is not an option, okay? 30 seconds on the clock, here we go. Hey, happy Easter Veiled Church. Who said Reese's eggs? Come on, let's see the hands. Let's see the roll. Yeah, there it is. Hey, if you don't know who I am, my name is Sean Jensen, and this is my first Easter with y'all. I'm so excited to celebrate. It's amazing. We have amazing people. While you're clapping, might as well say hi to everyone joining us online. Come on, let's say hi to people all over Illinois, Colorado, Minnesota, Mississippi. We see you. Uh, we're going to jump in the Easter message here in a moment, but I do got to say that because the tomb is empty, anything is possible. And I really believe that because, uh, you know, the reason why Jesus, like, came out of the grave and the tomb was rolled aside, like, he could have just walked through there, but he left it open so we could look in and see that it's still empty. And if it's empty, that means he's still alive. And if he's still alive, no matter where you are, I believe Easter is a day where people can get back up. And so if that's you today, I'm just praying that God would do that in your Heart. So I'm excited to celebrate with you today. A few weeks ago, I uh, picked up my 10-year-old daughter. Uh, she's like, you know, about right here on me. And I uh, picked her up. I don't know why people are laughing about that. It's like a short joke. <laughs> she's like right here on me. And uh, I would pick her up. And I, I carried her like she was like a 10-week-old. And I remember having a moment with her because she's growing up. And I looked at her in her eyes. And I was having like a really dad-daughter moment with her. And I looked at her. I said, Avery, this is how I carried you when you were a baby. And she looked at me in my eyes, and she's a very literal person, and she's like, Dad, I'm not a baby anymore. And I'm like, thank you, Avery, for ruining the moment. And I dropped her. <laughs> she let go. I did not drop her, I promise. I set her down nicely. But the fact that is, is it's so true, is I can't treat her the same way I did uh, when she was a baby. I actually have to treat her a little bit differently. I, I can't control her as much as I used to. I have to help you know, train her as she grows up. And the reason I say that is because when we talk about Easter, sometimes in our faith, we kind of treat Jesus like it's still Christmas. And what I mean by that is Christmas is where we celebrate baby Jesus, and that's great. But Easter is where we celebrate King Jesus. 
And we gotta understand that Jesus actually grew up. And I get it, because with our faith, if you're new to this faith, or maybe you have questions about this faith, or maybe you're here and you don't want to be here, we're glad that you're here, or you've been following Christ for a long time. It's easier to celebrate baby Jesus, because we can control a baby. It's a lot harder to accept the fact that we need a king. Uh, you can't control a king. And so whether we agree or not, we believe Jesus is sitting on the throne. He is king for us. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today because I believe my goal today is to encourage people on why we need a king and how that's a good thing. We need someone ruling our life and reigning our life and we put our trust in someone. And so just in case you still have a picture of Jesus in a manger as a baby or maybe the flowing blonde hair with the purple sash, which is not true, let me give you a picture of what Jesus actually looks like. We're going to go to the end of the book of the Bible. It's Revelation. I know, Easter message and we're going to Revelation. I have lost my mind, but it's going to be great, all right? In this moment, this is Jesus now coming back with his church to establish his kingdom on earth, which we see after he's coming back for his church, and then we're going to rule and reign with him forever. It's going to be amazing, and this is the moment he comes back. It says, then I, this is John, writing from a vision he saw, saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press on his robe. At his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. You don't have to show your kids Braveheart anymore. You just read it in a few verses. That is amazing. But look at this. We see many crowns. We see flames of fire. We see swords coming out of mouth, but we also see that Jesus had a tattoo when he comes back. And it says, written on his thigh, it said, king of all kings and lord of all lords. I love how they made sure it was lowercase. Because in our life, we will have things that try to take lordship. In our lives, there'll be kings and lords and things that try to rule us, but Jesus came to set the record straight. He will be the king of all kings, and he will be the lord of all lords. Whether we accept that or reject that, that is the statement he is making. And so maybe you're here today, and you don't understand really what that looks like. We're going to hopefully encourage you that making Jesus king of your life is probably the best decision you could ever make in your life. Whether you believe, you don't believe, I think it's a good thing when we make Jesus king. It seems like we don't want to give people authority of our life, but when we give Christ authority, I believe it can change our life forever. And so I want to encourage you with that, but I'm going to take a moment to pray because I need the Holy Spirit's help. So Lord, please help me today. It's Easter. The tomb is empty. Jesus, you are alive. And if you are alive, that means you're still at work here on earth. And so if there's anyone in here who needs a touch from you, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do what I can't do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So what we're going to do to convince you is we're going to go back in the Old Testament now. So we were at the end of the Bible. Now we're going to go back to the nation of Israel. This is God's chosen people that he would protect and guide and lead. Even though they were rebellious, God was faithful to them. And so in this moment, what we're going to see is this guy named Samuel. Samuel was a prophet. God would use judges and prophets to lead his people. And that's how he would protect them. That's how he would guide them. That's how he would correct them and coach them. And so in this moment, Samuel's getting older and his kids are kind of wicked and no one wants them to become prophet next. And so the nation speaks up and actually says something pretty bold and they actually reject God as king. Let's check this out. It says, look, they told him to Samuel, you are now old. Dang, right? Like, shoot it straight, y'all. Like, Samuel, you're old and your sons, well, they suck. They're not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with the request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving the same treatment. Do as they ask, but soundly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So in this moment, in their request for a new king, they didn't even realize they were rejecting the best king. Up until this moment, they didn't even realize the reason why they were at the place they were at was because Jesus, our God was their king all along. 
Up until this moment, God has rescued them from Egypt. God has set them free from their enemies. He provided for them when they had no food. When it was dark, he gave them guidance and lit, lit the way for them and where to go. He had them step into the promised land and had a place for them to settle. He was faithful to his promise and every enemy that was in that place that came against them, he protected them, he guided them, he led them. And now in this moment, they're saying, we want a king from this earth. They wanted a earthly king and they rejected their heavenly king. In this moment, they said, we want a king just like all the other nations. What if we are rejecting the best king in our life and we're settling for a knockoff? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Like the nation of Israel, they wanted the king from Temu, right? Timu, for those who don't know what it is, or like, I don't know either, wish. It may look like it's going to help. It may look like the real thing, but really it's not. And what if there's some things in our life that aren't really the real thing that we're asking to lead our life and to rule our life, and instead it's leaving us high and dry in this moment they rejected God. And I know it's 2024 and we don't use you know, terminology like king and kingdom, but Jesus was very clear that he is a part of the kingdom of God. And for those who are in Christ, they get a part of that kingdom as well. And so we don't use that terminology as much, but what I'm trying to convince you is a king has authority, a king has power, a king is in charge, and a good king is worth following. And so what I'm saying is who has charge in our life? And some people may convince themselves they don't need a king, Jesus isn't king, and I'm doing just fine without one. But I want to convince you today that no matter what you say, all of us have a king in our life of some sort. All of us have something that rules us every single day. We can say we don't have anything, but it's true. I mean, in our day and age, cash is king, power is king, success is king, influence is king, likes and follows is king. Sex is king, status is king, and we will allow these things to rule and reign our life, and man, they are counterfeit kings. They will leave us high and dry. And why do we do it? Well, the nation of Israel did because they had their eyes on other nations. They said, we want to be like other nations. Forgetting God's like, I don't want you to be like other nations. You are set apart. And church, I want to convince you, if you're in Christ, we're not called to be like everybody else. We're called to be followers of Christ, and that looks different. And he also said, honestly, if that, that at the end of it, they thought the authority was the issue and it wasn't them. <laughs> we need a new king because the king and the prophets are the problem, not, not us. And I know that I can be a problem. So why do we want to be king? Well, if I'm honest, I like control. I like to be in control. I think the biggest thing I wrestle with when it comes with following Christ is I want to be in control of everything he has. That, that's what I want. And if I'm in control, then I can be king. But here's the truth. Some people won't even be here this weekend because they couldn't control if they got sick or not. There's some things that we can't control. And at the core, let's just be honest, we are king. We want to be king of our life. We want to do what we want to do, when we want to do it. We want to do it how we want to do it. And then I have found out in my life, the person who deceives me the most, lies to me the most, hurts me the most, and puts me in most painful situations has always been myself. I make a lousy ruler. I don't know about you. I'm not speaking for you, but, but I make a lousy ruler. I don't get it right all the time. I need someone to guide me. I need someone to lead me. It's a lot of pressure to try to lead through this life. So can I convince you that Jesus is king? Can I convince you to make him king of your life? I think it's going to encourage you to do so. So a few reasons why. I'm gonna show you in scripture on why I think Jesus would be a great choice for you to make king in your life. First off, he's humble. Jesus is humble. He's a humble king. Have you ever met someone where the power went to their head, right? Like they abused their authority. Like they, they were given a promotion or they got authority and it went straight to their head. They got a big ego. <laughs> I see this every time I ask my eight-year-old daughter to go ask my 10-year-old daughter to get off her tablet. I'm like, hey, Charlie, can you go let Avery know? I don't know if this is good parenting. I'm like, can you go let Avery know it's time to get off her tablet? My daughter Charlie's like, me? <laughs> it's like the moment I asked her, I'm like, you thought I asked her to become the president of the United States of America. Like American flag drops behind her, eagles and fireworks are coming off her head. She's like, I got it, dad, let's go, right? Like, and, and she walks up the steps. You hear her go up there like large and in charge and all of a sudden she walks and she goes, Avery, daddy said it's time for you to get off the tablet or he's going to ground you for life and ship you away. I'm like, I didn't say that, Avery. I think it sometimes, but I've never said that. Don't look at me. I love my kids. I just got to be real with you sometimes, right? <laughs> love them a lot. 
Have you ever seen someone where the authority has gone to their head? Abraham Lincoln said, nearly all men and women, we can put that in there too, can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man or a woman's character, give them power. You want to see what's on the inside? You want to see how people handle themselves? Give them more authority. Give them more power. You'll find out real quick what comes out. Some of us have been under power that has abused their authority. Some of us had coaches and teachers and leaders and bosses, and this might be a little painful. Some of us have had ministry leaders and pastors who have used their power to abuse others. I don't know, that I've had to at times as a pastor realize that authority went to my head and I've had to apologize and it's a sobering moment. So maybe you're here and you're a victim of someone who's abused their power. And I don't want this to feel like a plug, but I wanna invite you next week because I think our church is gonna go through a season of healing because next week we're actually starting a series called I Love Jesus But Not the Church. And we're gonna talk about church hurt and how the church can navigate that. And if you've been hurt by the church, I'd encourage you to come. I really feel like it's gonna be powerful. But the reason I bring it up is because a lot of people are hurting because of people have abused their power, whether in the church or outside the church. And we've hurt people from abusing our power. Abe Lincoln used his presidential power to abolish slavery. Abe Lincoln used his presidential power to bring freedom to the US. He used his power to serve others. We can either use our power to serve others or we can use our power to control others. Jesus is a perfect example of what it looks like to serve others in their care because the higher you go, the lower you need to get. And so Paul talks to the church in Philippi. He says, you don't need to put your interest above others. Actually, you need to put others' interest above yourself. And he says, you need to look like Jesus And so what does Jesus look like, Paul? Well, Paul tells us what Jesus looks like. In Philippians, he goes, this is what we need to look like. Though he was God, Jesus, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Let's just process this for a second. First, we need to understand something. What's the first thing he said about Jesus? He was God. There are a lot of secular historians who will say there was a man named Jesus who walked this earth. We see it with Josephus letters. We see actual people, real life people saying, this is true. Secular and Christian historians say Jesus walked this earth. The issue people deal with is if he was God. We believe he was God, that he said he was God and the tomb is empty. He did not just go in the grave and stay because he finished the work of Jesus Christ. He's alive and reigning today. He's not just man, he is God. Now, think about this. If he is God, that's a lot of authority. Jesus has a lot of authority. At any time, he could have used his authority for the wrong reasons while he was on his earth. So let's see what he used it for. What did he do? He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being and lived the human experience. When he appeared in human form, he even humbled himself in obedience to God. Can I say the most humble thing we can do is be obedient to Christ? And he died a criminal's death on the cross. So Jesus used his power to come into this life among us and he eventually died a criminal's death on the cross. And listen, he wasn't even the criminal. We were. He died for us. That was how he used his power. Let me say it this way. Uh, my wife went to the, Phil- to the Philippines for a couple weeks on a mission trip. And when she went there, she went to some places that were really, really intense, impoverished places. And while she was there, she brought back stories that there was so much poverty in this place that there would be a 10 by 10 room, 10 foot by 10 foot, and it would be mattress springs stuffed with trash, and four or five families would live in that space. It said that the people from this area would go to the city dump, find scraps and stuff in there, whatever it was, and they would burn it over a fire and they would make a food-like substance with it. And that's what they would sell on the street for people for food and also to make money. This is kind of the situation they saw. And so they went to share the gospel, help them get into churches and help the churches there to help meet those needs, to bring hope and life. Now, my wife was only there for a couple weeks, but there's missionaries who go and live in these places. They go to these places and they live among these people to help bring hope and life in Jesus' name. Now, can you imagine leaving the American privilege and stepping into a place like that? Y'all, we got food, we got water, we got full meals in our garbage cans right now. 
we got houses for our cars. They're called garages. <laughs> Just in case, whoop. <laughs> Heat and air. And imagine giving that up and going and living with a bunch of people who need help and who need hope. You are giving up your privileges to go spend time with them. This is what Jesus did for us. He left heaven. He left his palace. He left the best of the best, and he came into our mess. He is not scared of our mess. That's why people say, oh, I can't follow Jesus. I'm too messy. No, I'll encourage you. He comes into your mess, and he begins to clean that mess. He came into this world that was hurting, broken, impoverished, broken in spirit, and, and, and broken in blind people, and he preaches the gospel, and he comes and he dwells among us. He leaves the best of the best and he humbles himself. Why? So that he doesn't just walk alongside of us, but eventually he would give up his life for us. This is what Jesus did with his authority. Why is he a good king to follow? Because he understands what we go through. Why is he a good king to follow? Because he understands the people he is serving and he knows how to lead you through it. He's a humble king, full of humility, but don't get it twisted. He's a humble king, but he's also a victorious king. His humility led to victory. And ours will do the same as well. Yeah, he was born in the manger, but now he's on the throne. He came riding in Jerusalem on a little donkey for people to see him, but he's coming back on a white horse. He may have went on that cross and died for our sins, but three days later, he rose victorious and he is seated at the right hand of his father today. This is our king. He is victorious and a good king has conquered, right? A good king has territory. A good kingdom has a kingdom, and he knows how to rule it. And we have access to that place. And so now it says in Scripture that because Jesus finished his work, he is sitting with his Father in heaven. He's praying for us. He's cheering us on, and he's made a way for us. And this is what Isaiah says about the Lord in heaven. It says, the Lord says, heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. You checking this out? God is using us as an ottoman. Have you tried, look at this. He's just like, what's up? Like, he's like chilling. The earth is an ottoman to God. Now, people will look at this, and a lot of people actually won't, won't, won't look at this in the right lens. Now, think about this. Everything in our world, the pain, the suffering, the violence, the election season, the wars, everything in between, the trials, the tough things we walk through, the poverty, all of that that we face, the things that bring fear and worry to our hearts, it says that God is resting on it. The thing we are up at night about, he's resting on, showing he's in control over it. Now, there's a lot of people who actually don't come to faith because of scriptures like this. They look at the scripture and think, this is why I don't follow your God, because he's a far off, distant God who doesn't care about his people. That's not what the scripture is saying. There's a lot of scripture that talks about how God wants to bring hope to this world. I'm telling you, there's a lot of scripture that he cares about this world. Actually, do you know why, if you're a follower of Jesus, why you're not in heaven already? Like, why do you think that he left you here? Because the way that we are gonna find freedom in this world is through the church. You know what God's answer was to a hurting, broken, impoverished world? It was his church. That's why it's called the body of Christ. Can I convince you? Jesus is still walking this earth. It's called the body of Christ. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus. If there's an area that has not been reached yet, he's looking for the church to step up and do it. The problem is not God who's resting on the earth. The problem is the church has fallen asleep. And he's saying, we are called to help those who are hurting. We are called to help those who are broken. So that's not what the scripture is saying. What the scripture is saying is God has ultimate authority over everything we walk through. That no matter how dark it gets, he's in control. That no matter how scared you get, he's in control. He is king. And now that we trust in him, we live in a kingdom that goes beyond this world. We get a king who's resting on what we're worried about. That's what he's trying to show here. Actually, Jesus hints towards this when he's on earth. He's hanging out with his disciples at the Last Supper. He's preparing them before he goes to the cross. And he mentions something to them at their Last Supper. He says, I have told you these things. What things are he talking about? At the Last Supper, he's mentioned things in John previously to this moment. He's mentioning that when he leaves, he's gonna spend, uh, send them a helper named the Holy Spirit who's gonna help them and transform them, give them the words to speak, give them power, give them transformation. 
He goes, I'm also gonna talk about how I'm the vine and you're the branches, that apart from me, you can do nothing, but if you stay and you remain in me, you will produce fruit. There'll be life, there'll be freedom in your life. There'll be fruit in your life. And he goes, don't forget. And he also says, when you go through grief and you go through trials, I will give you joy. These are the things he's talking about. He goes, now that I have told you these things, so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. You see, when you follow Jesus and you make him a king, I am not telling you that you're never gonna have trouble anymore. Scripture tells us right here, we will have trouble. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, you will have troubles. You will have troubles. You will have trials and it will get hard. I don't make Jesus king of my life so I won't have troubles. I make Jesus king of my life for the troubles. I don't, I don't follow Jesus as king so I don't have troubles and hardship. I follow Jesus as king for my troubles and hardship. He says, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I'm resting over it. We can either be overcome by the world or in Christ, we can overcome the world. And what does that look like? It looks like Jesus paying the ultimate price on the cross and rising from the grave. That even when death comes on this earth, if you are in Christ, you enter into a kingdom where you live forever with Christ. And I believe this to my core. A lot of people that I've met multiple times who don't believe this, they'll argue scripture with me and I'm completely fine with that. But one thing I always tell them, you can argue scripture all day, but you can never argue my experiences. Jesus has changed my life. And he can change yours too. He says, I've overcome, I've overcome all of it. I've conquered all of it. I've conquered sin, death, and the grave. And if you make me king, you get to conquer sin, death, and the grave too. Paul reminds the church of Rome this. He reminds them what I just told you. He says in all these things, Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Angels or demons, the present or the future or any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing we ever come in contact with will separate us from the love of God. But let's look at this. We are more than conquerors. I love this. A good king conquers, right? And we get access to his territory. Paul tells us, we're actually more than conquerors. Jesus conquered, and we are more than conquerors. Please bear with me, because I'm about ready to preach this thing, because I love this so much, all right? Lean into this. This word, conquerors, means Nikeo. It's where we get the word Nike. Let's do it, y'all, like you're looking at them right now. That's where we get the word Nike, Nikeo. It means victory. It means conqueror. When, when Paul puts the conquerors with we are more than, what he says is this word, hyper Nikeo which means super conquerors. We're more than conquerors. What does this look like? It means that Jesus fought a fight, but we get the riches of it. Think of it this way. There's a boxer. He boxes for a living and he has a family, a wife and kids, and he's going to fight one of the biggest boxing matches of his life with a $10 million purse. Not like a, one he wears over his shoulder. A purse is like the prize money, just in case you're not in the box. Like, why is he winning a purse? The money. A purse is like the go Anyway, so a $10 million reward. And, uh, and so he's going to win this. And his wife is too scared to go. So she sits back and watches on TV while the kids are playing, right? And so he goes into the ring to fight this match. And during the match, he gets punched. He takes blows to the face. His face is swollen. His eyes are bleeding. He's bruised and battered. He's getting some kidney shots and liver shots, like he's just getting beat up. But towards the end of the match, he strikes a blow and knocks out his opponent and gets a knockout and he wins the $10 million purse. He conquered that fight. And could you imagine if he takes all of that money, he runs home to his wife and he goes, look at what I have done. I have won the fight. I got a $10 million reward and you get none of it. <laughs> that wouldn't be very nice. Instead, his wife knew the moment that he won that fight, not only was the, mo the money his, it was the family's as well. What does this make her? It makes her more than a conqueror. She didn't have to fight the fight, but she gets the blessings of the fights. 
This is what Jesus did for us. He steps into the ring because of our sin. He takes the blows and the whips upon his back that says, by his stripes we are healed. He is beaten. He is flogged. A crown of thorns is put on his head. He is strewn on the cross and he is getting beaten for us. But three days later, he strikes a knockout blow and takes out our enemy, takes out death, takes out the grave, and he has won victorious. And guess what? We get all the riches of it. We get the inheritance of it. We get all the blessings blessings from it. When you choose to make God king, you didn't have to get into the fight, but he fought your fights. He fought that battle. Oh, death, where is your sting? Paul would say, it is swallowed up in victory. If you are in Christ, you don't have to fear sin anymore. You don't have to fear your past anymore. You don't have to fear death anymore because God has conquered it all, and we are more than conquerors. And so we, yeah, this is exciting. I celebrate on Easter all the time. Which means you will have troubles in this life, but you get to face them from a place of victory, not trying to get a place of victory because we have all of it. Why should you make Jesus king? Because he is victorious. He's a humble king. He's a victorious king. If you want victory over sin, death, and the grave, you want victory from anxiety. You want victory from depression. You want victory from these things. You might have to wrestle with them throughout this life, but we have a king who's able to conquer those things in your life. I've seen it. Those are the experiences. And nothing will separate you from this love, a love that got in the ring for you, a love that fought for you, a love that died for you, and a love that rose again and says, receive this. Now, here's the thing about the scripture. There's a lot of people who read the scripture and they go, cool, nothing can separate me from God's love. And they go do what they want to do. That's not what the scripture is saying. Because I have found out that you can offer someone love, but they can choose to reject it. Man, I love some people who are separated from me right now. I love some people that I know I walked alongside of and they made choices that put them in prison, that put them in bondage. I know some people that I've had to step away from with relationships because of choices they were making. I know that in my life, when I was running from the church, there were people in the church who loved me even though I was rejecting their love. Hear what I'm saying here? Nothing can separate us from this love, but we have to choose to accept it or reject it. And this is what makes it so important. This is gonna be a sobering statement, but I promise you it's important. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. And nothing will separate us from the judgment of God either. I got to talk about it Easter. Because love is just and just is love. Deep down, we are people of justice. That's why when you see someone being bullied, you want to step in. That's why when we see people who are hurting, we want to step in. We want to advocate for justice. And biblical justice is one of the most powerful things. It's love displayed. And so when we see the cross, we don't just see the love that God has for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him will not perish. That's love. But what did Jesus have to do? He had to serve justice. What is justice? It's when he went to the cross for our sin. Listen, Jesus is a humble king and a victorious king, but Jesus is also a just king. And we have to understand that that's important and we need that. See, a lot of people say, man, I've heard people say, like, God's not fair and you're grateful that he's not fair because if he is fair, we would be all doomed. So Jesus got what we got. But I would kind of push a little bit into that and say, no, God is very fair. He's very, very fair because someone had to die for our sin. If he wasn't fair, he'd just say, oh, don't worry about it. We'll forget about it. But because he's a holy God and we sinned, it says the wages of sin is death, which means someone has to die to pay for the penalty of sin. And so Jesus came to live a perfect life and the wrath of God that we deserve was laid out on Jesus. And a lot of people have an issue with this, right? Why would a loving God lay his wrath down? We never ask what we did to sever the relationship. We always ask, why would God want to do that? Because he's holy. He wants relationship with us. And so he pours his wrath out on his son on the cross. That was justice and love at the same time. Why? So that people who put their trust in Jesus, that wrath that was poured on him, It will not be poured on us because Jesus sees us. This is important to understand. See, when Jesus was taking his final breaths on the cross, we've heard this phrase before. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
We gotta understand this today. That word, it is finished, he was saying to telestai. It's a Greek word, and it's used in different categories. Let me show you real quick. In a business, in a business context, to telestai, in ancient times, it would say that if there was an ancient receipt. So if someone owed a debt, when it was paid in full, they would get a receipt that was called, it's been finished, it's to telestai. It was also used in the judicial context for anyone who had to serve a sentence. If they had a sentence they had to serve, when that sentence was served in full, it was finished, to telestai. And it's also a military context, which means if you would go and fight a battle in a war, you would go out and fight that battle. And if you had victory and you won, it is finished, to telestai. So when Jesus was on the cross and he looked at us after forgiveness and said, to telestai, it is finished, what he was saying was, the debt we owed because of our sin was paid in full. The sentence we need to serve because of our sin has been tried in full. And the battle that we have to brew on ourselves has been won in full. We are fully victorious. When he said it is finished, he finished it once and for all, for all of us. But we get to choose if we accept it or reject it. And so now he's in heaven with God. He did it. He paid the price and people reject him or accept him. And this is why Paul tells his protege, Timothy, when he's preaching to the church, he says, I want to remind you of something, Timothy. I urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who what? Will someday judge the living and the dead. Don't forget this in your preaching, Timothy. One day, we're going to have to give account to our God. Don't forget this, Timothy. What we do is important. We've got to remind people the love of God, but we also have to remind people the grace of God, but also the justice of God. He's encouraging him. Who's the living? Those who place their trust in Jesus and make him king. Who's the dead? Those who've rejected that love and they still are under trespasses. Their debt has been paid, but they have not received that. See, when I was in high school, me and my brother, my parents went out for the weekend and my parents said we could have a couple friends over. So at midnight, there was about 40 people at our house and uh, <laughs> wasn't making really good choices at that time. And some reason, we got a fog machine out, and we decided to fill up the entire house. Every square inch of our house was full of fog. You could not see right in front of you. Toilet paper rolls flying through the house, hitting people in the face, things crashing in the distance, people making choices they shouldn't be making. It just got out of control. And we knew our parents were going to be home early morning, and so at 5 in the morning, we decided we need to air this thing out. Young people don't get any ideas. We opened up the windows, and smoke began to billow out. It looked like our house was on fire. We kicked people out. We only kept a couple friends over. And by the time our parents came here, they walked in and they're like, hey, how are you guys doing? I'm like, great, everything's fine. How are you guys? Great weekend, chill, just chill, you know. And in this moment, we were talking and we realized we got away with this until I heard my mom from the distance. She said, what is all this film on the mirror? We didn't realize that the fog machine we had was an oil-based fog machine which means it left a residue all over the house. Every square inch of the house had this thick film on it. Sure enough, I had to talk to Dad, and we were grounded. And I say this because my, my dad loves me and he cares about me, but there's a lot of things in my life I chose not to do because I knew if I did them, I would have to talk to Dad. Not because I was just afraid of him, but because I didn't want to disappoint him, and I know he loved me, and he was trying to lead me. And what I'm nervous about is that we don't tell people enough is God loves you. He sent his son to die for you, but we live our life ruling our own life. We don't need a king and we think we're gonna get away with it. But at the end of our life, we're all gonna have to talk to dad. We're all gonna have to talk with God. And he's gonna look at you and he's gonna say, did you make my son king? Did you see what I did for you? And people are gonna go, yes. And he says, come on in. Or they're gonna say, no. We didn't. And scripture says that every knee will bow at Christ and every tongue will confess. He's king no matter what it is. We will bow now or we will bow later. We can see Jesus as king and voluntarily bow today or we can reject Jesus as king and we're gonna have to mandatorily bow when we meet him face to face. We bow today, we are always with Christ forever. We live this life and we talk with dad even though he loves us, he'll say, you have to separate from me because I can't condone with sin. I made a way for you. With eyes closed in this place, if you don't know Jesus as king, 
this is who he is. He loves you. He's won the victory. He's won all of it. But you have to accept it. If you want to accept that today, I don't want to hesitate right now. You can pray this prayer to God from the depths of your heart. I did this when I was 19 years old, and it changed my life. You just got to call out to God. You just got to believe that he died. Not your works. Just put your faith in the finished work of Christ. Meaning, you have to say this, Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. I'm a sinner. You're a savior. Just pray this prayer right now. Say, I'm a sinner. Jesus, you're a savior. I make you king today. Forgive me. Thank you for making me new. Thank you for leaving the grave so I could be alive in Christ. I don't want to live my way anymore. I want to live your way. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And just like that, you made him king. You may not feel different, but when you walk that out, I promise you, he will lead you. He's a great king. If you're here before we leave today, I cannot let you leave without acknowledging you. So here's what I'm gonna do. We're not gonna embarrass you, but we wanna celebrate you. I know it's a big room, but don't worry about the people next to you. You're not giving an account of them at the end of your life. At the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to lift up your hand for one reason, so we can applaud you and celebrate you, and one of our amazing ushers can get a box in your hand that's gonna help you with the decision you made. That's gonna bring clarity to you. Don't hesitate in that moment. So if that's you and you prayed that prayer and you made Jesus king, just do it boldly and leave that hand up until we get you a box. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he dies again. Three, if you said that was me today, I made Jesus king of my life. I want you to throw your hand up as high as possible. If there's anyone overflow too, make sure you lift up your hand as well so that we can see you or online that we can make sure. All right, I just wanna make sure. Well, praise God. Well, church, let's celebrate the people who made that decision last night because that's amazing. And well, every weekend, it is so exciting to see people taking next steps in their faith journey. And here, we believe that everybody has a next step in their faith journey. So the question is, what's yours? We've had people this weekend already taking the next step of following Jesus for the first time, but maybe you've made that decision already and your next step is to get baptized or to join a small group or to start serving in some capacity. Whatever your next step is, we wanna know about it, we wanna celebrate it, we wanna partner with you in that because we believe that nobody goes on this journey alone. And so if you're ready to take your next step, I wanna ask you to text the word next to the number on the screen or to fill out that next step card from the seat in front of you and drop that off at the info counter so that we can connect with you guys. Now again, if you're visiting with us today, you've already taken the next step because you showed up and that is awesome. We are so glad you are here. I wanna also remind you, please text the word next to that number or turn that card in because when you do that, not only will we be able to reach out and just connect with you this week and see how your experience was, but if you're visiting with us and you text that number, you turn that card in, we're also gonna make a one-time donation to a local ministry partner in your honor just because you showed up today. And the reason we do that is we believe that we are wired for generosity. We believe that giving is something God wants for you and not from you. And so if you would like to partner with us in all that God is doing in and through his church, through your generosity, there are several ways that you can do that. If you're out cash or check donations, you can put those in any of our drop boxes located on the walls at both exits or out in the lobby. But you also can give digitally by going to our website, veil.church. You can text the word veil to 77977, or you can give using the free Veil Church app. Now, as we get ready to dismiss you guys in just a few seconds, I wanna invite you guys to come back next week as we start our new series. And we are excited for what God is gonna do through this. And so next week, we are back to our normal service times, Saturday at four and Sunday at nine and 11. And we would love to invite you to come back to that. Now, as we dismiss out of here today, we're gonna keep this room a little quieter. And if you would like to take communion, we've got that available on our stage. And if you would like prayer for anything, members of our prayer team are down here ready to meet you. Now, we know that there's a lot of people here. There's more people coming in for the next service. And so as you get into the parking lot, let's remember, let's have a little bit of patience and all that stuff. But I also wanna remind you that we have got two exits from our parking lot. So if you can make your way around and go out the other exit, that would help out as well. We are so glad you guys are here today. We hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Happy Easter. We'll see you back next week.